also, as you know, we have a vision of starting 10 campuses in 10 years. Uh, we are looking at uh, increasing the number of people that are on our Leon Springs launch team, increasing the number of people that are on our Divine launch team. And so if you would like to be part of either one of those, and maybe you want to be part for just a little while, maybe for three months, maybe six months, maybe a year and come back, or maybe you'd like for those places to be your new campus one day, we're trying to increase the number. So please pray about becoming part of one of those launch teams. You can sign up on the Church Center app. Uh, just go there and sign up for the launch team. We'll add you and let's start letting you know about everything that's going on. God bless you and thank you. There's a lot going on in May. On May 8th, the men's ministry is putting on muffins for moms to let all the moms know we love, appreciate, and care for them. And so bring your moms, bring your grandmas, come and hang out and just show them that you love them and celebrate them early that morning in between the two services. May 14th is the men's prayer breakfast. They're doing it a little bigger this time. It's going to be in the foyer with barbacoa and big red. I love me some barbacoa and big red. I'll be there. We want to see all of you there. May 21st. This is a date change and it's because they're doing something a little special. It's the women's Bibles and brunch. It's going to be here on campus outside and they're moving it from nine to 10. So there's some changes there. If you normally go to the, the Bibles and Prunch. So check the app to make sure you're up to date on everything that's going on there. Also starting in May, the week of May 15th is Lifelines. Lifelines are our small groups. We believe in the power of small groups and being plugged in with other people chasing after Jesus together. And so I want you to go to your church center app and go to the groups tab, click on Lifelines and scroll through there and find one for you for this upcoming session and sign up today. The Young Adults Life Retreat, Youth Camp, and Kids Crop are all coming up in the summer months. If you are interested in any of those and if you fit within those age ranges, please make sure that you check out the app for more info and details so you can sign up for those and we can get you more information. But the Life Retreat, the last day to sign up is Tuesday, May 3rd, so make sure that you sign up for that if you are a young adult. We are beginning to have youth services on Sundays now in June, so make sure that you check out the app for what's to come with that. Thank you. Hey, Crossroads, we want to encourage you to continue to live a generous lifestyle, uh, generous in your giving in all different kinds of ways. I want to remind you that you can give to the church uh, using our Church Center app. You can also give through the website, or if you'd like to write a check or use cash, you can put it in an envelope and put it in one of our giving boxes in the hallway. We appreciate all that you do. We know that you're doing it for the Lord. We know that he will bless you as you continue to help fund this ministry. God bless you. Amen. God is good. All the time. You know, this side is doing much better than this side. I'm just saying. Y'all want to try again? God is good. They did. They got you on that one. I'm just saying they got you on that one. Hey, I want to finish this series in the earth trembled. If you want to turn in your Bibles with me to John chapter 20. As you do, I really want to encourage you to, to consider being part of one of our launch teams. We believe we have a, a unique church these days because our priority is Jesus, not politics, not social justice, not fellowship. All those things are important, but Christ is number one. And, uh, and so we, we feel like, you know, in, in different areas, churches are changing their priorities, and so we want to keep Christ as the main focus of the body of Christ, amen? And uh, so that's why we're doing that. So you can join on the app. You can go to, uh, I think it's groups. Go to groups, and you see all the different launch teams, so just consider being part of that. Let's read this in John chapter 20, verse 1. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they put him. So Peter and the other disciple started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over and looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. Then Simon Peter came along behind him and went straight into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. The cloth was still lying in its place, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went inside. He saw and believed, but they still did not understand from Scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to where they were staying. Now, 
Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. They asked her, woman, why are you crying? They have taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they have put him. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize that it was Jesus. He asked her, woman, why are you crying? Who is it you're looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him and I will get him. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said, do not hold on to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just pray that you would open our hearts and our minds to your word. Your word contains the words of life, the words of transformation. And so we want to receive you. I pray that you would filter out anything that is not of you, that you might be glorified in Jesus' name. And everybody said together, amen. We're talking about this idea of what happens when there is an earthquake. If you remember, I was saying uh, on the first day of this series that there was 17 earthquakes in the scripture. I'm not going to go through all 17, okay? But we've been talking about every time there's an earthquake, God is doing something, shaking something. In the book of Hebrews, it says that he will shake everything that can be shaken. He says, I, I will shake everything that has been created, now, because God is our creator, then anything that can be shaken is something he has given to us. In this case, Mary Magdalene had received a gift from God in the man named Jesus. He was flesh and blood. She could talk to him. She could hear him audibly. She could embrace him. He would embrace her. She was able to walk with him and talk with him. She was able to serve him in, in, in such a glorious way. And now he's gone. There, there are gifts that God gives you for a season, and this is what we've been talking about. God will give you what you need in a season to help get you through, to help move you to the next level, to help you in some way, but it's only for a season, and those things will be shaken loose. And, and what feels firm under your feet will get turned upside down and messed all up and flipped upside down, and, and what allowed your life to feel stable and secure will suddenly be gone. We, we, we find security in relationships, we find security in money, we find security in jobs, we find security in friendships, we find security in so many different ways, but all of that is created, which means that any time the Lord can bring a season where you lose what you had, where you lose the gift that you have, and, and what do you do? In this particular scene, we see Mary and Peter and John, and they are in the tomb, and they are there, and Peter and John leave, and then Mary is left there, and it says she looks into the tomb as she weeps, and she sees the angels. It, it tells us where the angels are located, which is interesting to me. Why do I need to know where they are? But, but they're sitting down. And so I want you to kind of get a picture of this. When you go into a, a, the tomb of Christ, it would have been hewn into a, a mountainside or a, a hillside. And so there's no natural light. There are no windows. There is nothing like that. And you go in there, and there is a, a, a room cut out. And then in a wall, there is a cavity cut, cut out. And that's where they would lay the body. And, and so here she is looking into this tomb and it is dark everywhere except now there are angels and the light of God is shining through the angels and they are sitting down. And, and it's almost as if they were inviting her in. Almost as if they're saying, C come on into the tomb. C come on into the death. I want you to embrace the pain. Everything is messed up. You don't know what's going on, Mary. You, you are so oblivious, and you can't figure out this or that, but we want you to come in. And the Bible says that they were sitting down. Now, why do I need to know they were sitting down? Most of the time when you see angels, they are standing, and they are glorious, ginormous beings. But here it says they are sitting, reposing, resting, resting in the tomb. 
resting surrounded by death, resting in the midst of an earthquake. And I believe that God is saying, when, when I am allowing an earthquake into your life and when everything gets all messed up and what felt secure is undone, you have to be invited in because inside that tomb is where you find rest. Now, I don't like the tomb. I don't like the pain when, when things go bad and everything gets messed up and we go through the earthquake or the tomb or whatever we had is gone and the gifts are no longer there. We don't like it. We fight it. We resist it. And here we have the angel saying, come on in. This is where you find rest. How, how can I find rest when everything's a mess? How can I find rest when, when what I thought God was doing is now what he's not doing and, and what I thought God had given me he has taken away and what I thought I would have for my whole life is gone and all these good things. How do I find rest in that? And that's what we want to talk about today. Amen? I want you to get a picture of these angels and it, it tells us where they're at. One is at one side, one is at the other. One is where the head would be, one is where the feet would be. And, of course, Christ is gone. There is no body. And so I want you to get a picture. They're in this dark cave, and, and then in the cavity where the body would be, you have an angel on this side and an angel on that side. Now, Jesus, we know through the process of being flogged by a cat of nine tails, by being crucified, that his body is ripped to shreds. He has been torn apart. He is so bloody. He literally looked like the bloody lamb of God. And the Bible says that, that he no longer looked recognizable as human because he had been torn apart so much. And so his body has been laying there, and his physical body has been there for three days. And so in this cavity, I would imagine it is blood all in this little area. And then you have the darkness, and you have the blood, and you have this, this table-like thing, and the blood, and the angel on this side, and the angel. Why do I need to know where the angels are? Why do we need to know? I want to take you back to the Old Testament. And in Exodus chapter 25, we have God explaining how the temple is to be built and what it's supposed to look like. And, and, and in a minute, I'll go kind of through all of that, but, but the temple had three different areas. It had a courtyard. Everybody say courtyard. And then it had a holy place. Everybody say holy place. And then it had the most holy place. Everybody say the most holy place. Why is he making me repeat everything? It's just to help you remember. Amen? And so there are three different places. Now, in the most holy place, this is the area where only one man, the high priest, could go into one time a year to offer the atonement sacrifice. And there was only one thing inside of this room, and that was the Ark of the Covenant. This was a, a box, a wooden box that had gold on the inside and gold on the outside. It, represent, it represented Jesus Christ who came from the glory of heaven to a wooden cross and then returned back to the glory of heaven. And, and it had a cover on it. And, and, and so I want to read to you how the cover was to be created, how it was supposed to be designed in Exodus 25 verse 17. And so it says, make an atonement cover of pure gold, no wood, just pure gold, two and a half cubits long and a cubit and a half wide, and make two cherubim, everybody say cherubim, those are angels, make two cherubim out of hammered gold at the ends of the cover. So you have a long cover, it was an ark, and you had an angel on this side and an angel on that side. The cherubim are to have their wings spread upward, overshadowing the cover with them. The cherubim are to face each other, looking toward the cover. Now, I believe, and I want to suggest to you, that the reason the angels are here and the reason the Holy Spirit is illuminating to us where the angels are sitting is because he's drawing our attention back to the most holy place. He, he's getting us to, to put together this area of darkness uh, with the most holy place of the temple. Now, the most holy place was a room that had a giant curtain that was so thick, it, it, it was un, unable to be ripped by human hands. So the Bible said when Jesus died, it was ripped from top to bottom. It was God himself ripping the curtain. But in this room, there was no natural light. There were no windows. 
All that was in there is they would bring the the light of incense and they would burn it there that represented the glory of God and you had this golden box and this golden cover and the angels came up like this and their wings touched and in this space in between the angels, that's where the Shekinah glory of God was. And God would say, that's where I will meet with you, in this area And the high priest, when he would go into this room, he would take the lamb of God and he would take the blood and he would come in and he would sprinkle the blood all over this atonement seat. So you had this this flat uh, golden box, this, this area right here that was covered in blood and had angels on one side or the other. The tomb is the most holy place. The most holy place is where you experience God to the fullest measure. It is a place where you experience the love of God, the forgiveness of God, the compassion of God, the glory of God in its fullest, and now the angels are saying, this is the place, the place that hurts, the place where everything falls apart, the earthquake, the tomb, when the gifts are gone, when the blessings are no longer there, this is the most holy place. Because when everything is gone, when you've lost it all, You don't have anything else to depend on except him. And he's teaching us here that in these seasons when we lose things and the blessings are are shifted and shaken, what we thought we could depend on is no longer there. God is saying, I am shaking that so you don't worship that. But in this moment, this moment in the tomb, in the earthquake, in the pain is the greatest potential for intimacy with me. Amen? Amen? If we go back through the design of the temple and the courtyard and the holy place and the most holy place, it is depicting to us the journey of Christianity. And so when you went into the temple courtyard, the first place you would go was the altar of sacrifice. And so this is a place that that represented the repentance of man. You cannot come to God unless there is a repentant heart. And so we come to God, we recognize he is the sacrifice, and so you have this altar where there is sacrifice, there is repentance, it is all there. This is the moment we give our heart to Christ. This is salvation. This is how we move. And then the next thing was the washing place. And so because there was so much blood everywhere, then you would go and everything would be washed. When you receive Jesus Christ as your sacrifice and you repent of your sins, then he cleanses you and washes you clean. You are washed by the blood of the Lamb, amen? So you can know all of your sins have been forgiven, amen? And if you go to heaven and you say, Lord, I'm sorry for this or that, he's going to look at the book and say, I ain't got no record of that. Amen? I like that. Because otherwise I'd have a long list. Amen? But that's the beginning. You're not even in the holy place yet, much less the most holy place. And so then you would move into the holy place. In the holy place, there were three different uh, pieces of furniture. First, you had the lampstand. And so you had the lampstand that had lamps on it, and you had fire, and you had light. And, and so this represented Christ. The whole temple represents Jesus Christ. Amen? He is our temple. We, we are his body. We are the body of the Holy Spirit, or the temple of the Holy Spirit. So all of this represents Christ. And so the lampstand represents Jesus who said, I am the light of the world. And he says, walk in the light as I am in the light. And he's teaching us that there is a wisdom on how to live life. And if you live in this wisdom, then you will receive the blessing of that wisdom. Amen? And so as I move in my Christian walk, I I give my heart to Christ. I receive that he has washed me of all of my sins. But then I got to begin to grow in my wisdom. I have to learn what the Bible says. I have to understand the principles of God. And the lampstand also is represented in the book of Revelation as a church. We need the church, right? Amen? Somebody say amen, right? We need the church because it's in the church that we learn from one another. The Bible has been written as a spiritual document, and you need the spirit of a teacher to teach, and you need the spirit of a student to learn. And so you teach me, and I teach you, and we teach one another. But when you're trying to live Christianity all by yourself, you don't learn nothing. You can read this or that, but you need the Holy Spirit to take you deeper, Amen? Now, another thing that was in, the, in the, the holy place was the table of showbread. Everybody say showbread. Now, this was the bread that was laid out all the time. The priests always had to make sure there was fresh bread out there. 
Ooh, I bet it smelled good. Anyway, I got distracted. So the, this represented the manna from heaven in the Old Testament where they had to go out every day and collect the manna just for that day. This represents God, Jesus Christ, as my sustainer. He is my provider. He gives to me what I need, when I need it, how I need it. He makes sure that I don't fall off when I need wisdom. He gives me wisdom. When I need comfort, he brings me comfort. When I need money, he provides whatever I need. And so this is me when I go in and I, and I give my heart to the Lord and I repent and he is my sacrifice. I begin to get the wisdom. I begin to understand he is my provider, my sustainer. And I'm moving forward and I'm getting closer, but I'm still just in the holy place. Hadn't even got to the most holy place yet. Now, also in the holy place, there is the altar of incense. This represents prayer. Now, Christ is my intercessor. The Bible says that he stands at the right hand of God interceding for you and I. Amen? Which means he's praying for you and I. Which means every time the accuser of the brethren, every time Satan goes up and says, you know what they did, they lied, they cheated, they did this, did that, then Jesus gets in there as my advocate and said, yes, but on that day, he accepted me as his Lord and Savior. He's been washed by the blood. He has been clean. The accuser of the brethren doesn't know what he's talking about, and the Father listens to the Son. Amen? And so I'm, I'm learning all this, and I'm gaining all this. This is as I'm journeying as a Christian, but I'm still in just the holy place. To move into the most holy place, I have to go through the curtain. Now, the Bible tells us in the book of Hebrews that Jesus' body, when it was ripped to shreds, was the curtain of the holy of holies. It was the curtain of the most holy place. And so when the, when the actual curtain ripped, it was symbolic that when Jesus' body was ripped, that opened up the most holy place that anybody could enter. And so it represents the flesh being crucified and the, and the sin in us being undone. And so when I go through into the most holy place, it is a moment of sanctification where God is changing my appetites, changing my desire, changing my craving, giving me power over temptation so that what is in me that is not God is being crucified so that I can live in the Spirit of God, I can walk by the Spirit, as Paul said, and I'm changed. Amen? Anybody glad for that? Remember who you used to be? Amen? Remember who you used to be and who you are now? Now, I want you to think about this. You are just barely getting into the most holy place. And finally, when you get into the most holy place, there is an intimacy with the Shekinah glory of God. The full manifestation of all that he is. Nothing between you or him. Too many of us get stuck at the altar of sacrifice. And we think, well, I've given my heart to the Lord. That's all I got to do. I'm done. You are so far away from the most holy place. Some of us get stuck at the washing. We think, well, I, I've, been, I've been cleansing my sin, and so praise God. But we never move into the holy place. And so we struggle accepting God as our sustainer. We struggle understanding and living in the wisdom of God. We sometimes get tricked into thinking God's not with us. He's not on our side. We forget he is our advocate working for us. And we begin to wonder, where is God in all this? Because we get stuck. But God is saying, I've got more for you. I want to bring you into the most holy place. Where there is an intimacy with the Shekinah glory of God that allows you to be transformed from the inside out so that you know that you know that you know that God is with you no matter what. That no matter what happens, no matter who says what or who does what, you can say, my God is with me. He is a light of, and my salvation. Of whom shall I be afraid? Amen? If God is with us, who can be against us? And, and there is an, a confidence and an assurance that says, I may not know everything that's going on. I don't completely, this is a dark place. I can't see anything. I don't have anybody. The high priest went in all by himself. When I don't have any friends, I don't have any relationships. Everybody left me. The church is all in a mess. Everything's all in a mess. I can still say, but I'm with him. And if I'm with him, that's all I need. And if he is my portion and I am his portion, that is all that I need. I don't need this. I don't need that. I don't need you. I don't need them. I don't need anybody. Amen? And now God is saying the most holy place is in the midst of your pain. 
when he hurt the most. It's when he's shaking everything else out. And because he's shaking everything else out, you ain't got nobody to depend on. You don't have a job. You don't have your friends anymore. Spouse has walked out on you. The church is split. Parents won't talk to you. Siblings are done with you. Friends have lied about you. And when you ain't got nobody else to depend on, that's when you depend on God in a new way. And he's saying, come on in to this place. Come on in. I know you don't have anything else, but I'm teaching you that I'm all you need. And there's so much potential for intimacy and growth and transformation inside the tomb in the midst of the earthquake. Peter and James, I mean, I mean, Peter and John and Mary all went into the tomb. Peter and John went in and all they saw were the strips of linen and the cloth around his head. They didn't see any angels. They went in and looked around and they took off and there they go. Mary looks in and she sees two angels. Why, why does Mary see angels and they don't? What, what is it about her that they say, come in, you're ready for this? She was mourning. She was grieving. She, she was struggling because she didn't know what was going on. She was confused. There was there possibly some kind of fear. All, all kinds of emotions are running through her. But in the end, what dictated her behavior was her love for this man, Jesus. Amen? Now, I, I want to suggest that when, the next time we see the disciples, they are stressed. They are worried. They are confused. They are living in fear. Jesus rebukes them when he finally shows up and says, why don't you believe? And, and so the disciples were being controlled by confusion and fear while Mary was being controlled by love. God is trying to say in your most painful moment, I want to turn your death tomb into the throne of grace. And what hurts the most will draw you into me more than you've ever been. And in your pain, I will be glorified and you will be loved and you will be changed. And what hurt will work for the good. Amen? Because Mary loved to the end. I believe she was rewarded in a way. Her faith and love, she, she didn't know what to believe. She was so confused. Remember at one time she believed, she took a hold of Jesus, then she wasn't sure, and she went back and forth, the complexity of the moment. But in the end here, because she just keeps on loving the best she knows how, she turns, and there's Jesus. If, if we can learn how to just keep loving God in the pain, he will show up. He will show up. Amen? He will show up. The Bible says, as surely as the sun rises, my God will appear. Though weeping may last through the night, joy comes in the morning. Amen? If you're in a dark place right now, quit letting confusion distract you. Quit letting fear, can, quit trying to go and fix your life or bring something back to life. Just love God. Just love, the Bible says love is, is patient. Be patient with God. Hadn't he been patient with you? Amen? Be patient with him. Be kind to him. Don't go off doing this or that that is against his word. Don't be mean to God. Don't grieve the Holy Spirit, but just love him. Just worship him. Just pray. You don't have to know what's going to happen tomorrow or next. You don't have to know what's going to happen next hour. All you need to know is that in the tomb, that is where God is saying, I want to be closer to you than we've ever been. Use your pain for victory. Don't let it defeat you. Amen? And that's what we have to learn. We go into the tomb and we are transformed in the intimacy of loving God. I wonder what, what was it about Mary that allowed her to do this? Everybody else is running, chickens with their heads cut off, 
figuring out what do we do. The guards that had fallen, they've gone back to their authorities and they said, you know, we don't know what happened. These angels showed up and now the body's gone. And, and so the, the, they couldn't have that. So they paid him money and said, just tell everybody these people took him. And so now they've committed a crime, a huge crime. And so fear and wonder and confusion and all that. And, and, but what was it about Mary that she wasn't afraid? In one gospel, when it's talking about this passage, it says, Mary, who was delivered from seven demons. See, I believe in that moment she was able to keep loving God. In the tomb, when everything was bad, because she remembered what he had done for her. Amen. Do you remember what God has done for you? Do you remember how many times he showed up? Do you remember all the healings and all the provision? Do you remember what he's done? The, the question is, how much do we love him? How much do we love him? When we get upset, when we lose the blessing, that is us understanding I love the blessing more than I loved him. And God is saying, that's the whole point of this earthquake. Because I don't want you loving that because that can't save you. But come to me. All who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. In the tomb, in the earthquake, remember what he's done for you. Remember how good he's been. Keep loving him, and you will leave the tomb confident, assured, knowing what he's done, and with a purpose. Amen. Hasn't God been good to you? Hasn't he been good to you? Stand up and let me pray for you. Heavenly Father, forgive us when we've let fear and confusion control. Lord, remind us of how good you've been. That we might love you, even in the tomb, so that the grave is transformed into a throne. And with confidence, we come to the throne of grace receive the love that only you can give. Help us remember how good you've been. Thank you. I love you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me. All my days I've been here.
been good to you? Amen. When you find yourself in the tomb, refuse to let fear or confusion dominate and just keep loving God. He will show up. Amen. Hey, if it is your first time here, we're so glad you're here. We want to encourage you to go back to the back and connect with us. Miss Barbara and Miss Gina are back there. We have a gift for you. You can also find Sarah out in the foyer. Uh, we want you to know about the church and how we would like to help you grow spiritually and experience all that God has for you. Amen. May the Lord bless you. May his face shine upon you and keep you all your days. May you have a good week and come back next week ready to worship again. Amen. God bless you. You're dismissed. Amen. Thank you.